Hello, and welcome to another Uptime FM episode. I'm your host, Sean C. Davis, and I am super excited to talk with Stephanie Eccles today on a topic that developers kind of love to hate, and that is CSS. So Stephanie works uh, during her day as a software engineer, but also has a number of super interesting side projects to, to benefit the developer community. And I'm, I'm sure we'll touch on at least several of those projects. But first, let's get Stephanie on stage. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. Hello, thanks for having me. Thanks for thanks for joining us. I'm, I'm really excited to have you here. And I, I feel like we, or at least on this show, we haven't talked a lot about CSS. So this is going to be um, really, really interesting and fun for me. But before we get into that, let's ask the question that I love to start with to break the ice. And that is, what is the best sandwich? All right. Well, my go-to that got me through the first several months of the pandemic when I wasn't sure how long I'd be home until going fully remote um, is the apple planter sandwich, which comes from a local cafe near where I grew up. You got uh, you want to spread Dijon mustard and honey on both sides of your bread, usually with turkey, slices of apple. That's the key ingredient there. Wow. Okay. And some sort of light cheese like a Havarti or provolone. Interesting. So is that is it tied to like one specific uh, deli or restaurant or is it just a, a generic sandwich in the region? Uh, one specific, I think. And ideally you do like some sort of like a um, cheese sourdough bread. I don't usually have that on hand, unfortunately, but that's the ideal. Right. <laughs> OK, it sounds really good. It kind of sounds like a, a fall sort of sandwich. But can you can you get it all year round? Is it the, the same? The quality doesn't really change. I think they serve it all year round. Yeah, I'm about four hours away from that sandwich currently, so I just have to make it at home. But <laughs> okay, okay, that's interesting. That's a that's a new one that I haven't heard, and and I guess a, a good reason to visit Nebraska have this this new and interesting sandwich. There you go. Yep. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, yes. Thanks for that. And let's um. So let's let's jump into CSS and. As I mentioned in the, the intro, I've been trying to be a little facetious and saying developers love to hate CSS, but I think that um, maybe to be a little bit more accurate, I've noticed that CSS tends to be fairly polarizing in um, the development community in the sense that it can feel really, um, really scary to some developers or um, really hard to developers who are otherwise really skilled at other um, other languages and other tasks. And so let's just start there. And I'll ask you, why why do you, from, from your perspective, why do you think that so many developers are afraid of or maybe dislike CSS, just generally speaking? Yeah, there's multiple contributing factors that I have observed through just kind of watching community discussions, but also throughout my 15 years of being in the industry and sort of growing up with the language, um, growing up as well. Um, so a lot of that stems from in the years past, and no longer the case, which I'm sure we'll talk about, but in years past, a quite a big discrepancy between uh, compatibility cross-browser. So that right there, of course, that's going to be a source of frustration. And that's a fair source of frustration. Um, there's also so many ways to do something, especially as the language has evolved. So something that we recommended a few years ago is, is not the same. That one I like to toss back at folks like, that's the same in JavaScript too, right? Like that's an yes, okay exactly. thing to expect <laughs> that. We should want that. We should want to see that, see that maturity and growth. Um, we desire, you know, usually that's a big splash in, you know, languages or frameworks um, outside of CSS. So. Um, you know, I, ho I hope to see sentiment changing as folks realize that, yes, there's multiple ways, but also let's talk about the benefits of these more modern ways, which is kind of my niche. Um, but also, uh, you know, just the general um, sentiment around the language being some maybe stereotypes that have crept in over the years where maybe it's, you know, front end just isn't as valued front of the front end. And so we see mm -hmm. that in mm -hmm. job postings, you know, so uh, if you're specializing in CSS, there wasn't a lot of, you know, solid, uh, you know, job descriptions that seemed made for those folks. Um, I also see that changing. I credit design systems for helping change that. There's titles like UI engineer, like 
I personally, um, my degree is in advertising. I spent eight years of my career in an in-house ad agency. That's a wonderful environment for folks that are creative, like to write CSS, like to live a little bit closer to the design language. But when you don't have, or I should say, you don't feel as comfortable with uh, sort of the design or style, that can also sort of falsely make CSS seem intimidating. Um, and so that's why I encourage folks to, uh, you know, you'll talk about uh, going back to the fundamentals, learning about the box model. If we peel back some of those layers, some of that intimidation can come off when you start to realize it's less about, or it's not wholly about design and style, but also we're placing boxes on the page, right? So peeling it back um, and trying to understand from that level. But usually we just get those kind of surface level um, protests against the language um, until you can convince folks to start learning about it a little deeper. That's a, okay. Great, great answer. And you touched on several things and I want to, I want to come back to the last point and also um, the, the work you're doing to, to push this, yeah, modern CSS approach. Um, but first quick question is, um, cause I don't, I don't stay totally up to date. And that is the, the, um, browser compatibility issues you were talking about of, you know, 10, 15, five, 10, 15 years ago, which I, I felt very much are those, are they gone completely? Or are there still like lingering issues that we're trying to solve there? The big ticket issues I would say have been addressed, um, not just recently, uh, although we've seen a lot of movement recently, by which I mean the last few months, but um, most of the things that ease a lot of the frustrations have been stable for two plus years in our evergreen browsers. Now, we also, I should mention, uh, <laughs> we all had a shared <laughs> enemy number one, right? Of <laughs> IE 11 and yes, yes. earlier. <laughs> um, yeah. So that was really transformative this year in particular to have Microsoft start moving towards um, the end of life process for that. It's not completely mm -hmm. gone. It depends on your industry. Folks always speak up like, I still have to deal with it. Um, but it's, it's, it's usually niche industry environments. Um, unfortunately, those niche industry environments are sometimes very critical, like healthcare or education. Um, so everything comes with caveats. Again, that's not exclusive to CSS. But um, when I think of problems that have been solved, I'm thinking of stability of grid, Flexbox as we move away from floats, which caused a lot of frustration, mm -hmm. um, where we're just basically trying to make the language do something it wasn't designed for. Now that feedback has been received and these features have been evolved to handle those scenarios that just simply were imagined at the start of the language or um, weren't possible in browsers, another big thing that happened was Chrome rewriting their layout engine. So uh, that improved efficiency of the language. Some of our fears about selectors uh, performance, those, those are not probably the source of your performance issues anymore. So just a lot of evolution um, in that space. Okay, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, um, and then you, you talked about some, yeah, having a background in advertising and also like the um, and, and so like the important of, uh, importance of visuals, but the emergence of design systems and how there still tends to be this kind of, I guess, for lack of a better term, like a lack of respect for the UI engineers or the front of the front engineers. And I've, I've seen that even in some of the circles that I've run in where folks, um, that specialize in those capabilities, it's harder to get their voice heard and it can be harder to find jobs and, and et cetera. And so I guess to, um, my, uh, I'm wondering how you counter that. Like what, how, how do you describe to somebody who doesn't respect that role or those capabilities, the importance of CSS and the importance of having people who can, can focus on just semantic markup and the, and the styles that go along with the, that markup? Yeah, there's a few different angles I think you can use, and it depends on context, what you're trying to build, who your stakeholders are, all those good factors. Um, one thing I'll say is that uh, folks that I've seen care about CSS or care about some of those really front of the front end 
features. They also really are the folks who care the most about accessibility. They're the folks who are caring mm -hmm. about performance, um, you know, and they're the folks that care about usability. And all three of those things are important for your actual users coming to your site or application, but they also make business sense. And so I think that we might be starting to see a little more turnover of those roles being more valued. Um, and when you can show the benefits of, you know, how those interplay um, and kind of prove out the benefits, then I think we're, we're going to see that more valued. But at the time, um, we see a lot of, you know, kind of the joke is full stack is <laughs> also expected to do CSS, right? And, and yes, yeah. <laughs> not, not happy about that sometimes. Um, and I think what also happens is you develop a lot of tech debt when you're not able to consider the factors I just mentioned. <laughs> um, and a lot of those can be addressed through CSS or at least caring about how the front end comes together. Um, but it feels like uh, the perception is that there, there's some strange loss of perception that that part doesn't make the money. And, and that's what it boils down to, right? In terms of when they're when a company is trying to hire for positions, uh, they want the most bang for their buck. Um, yeah. So they might realize they need a designer or they might realize they need a um, user researcher or something. They kind of start to get at some of those roles. But I think until their existing engineers in some cases can push back and say, we just really don't have the skill set, those roles may not become uh, available. And I don't think that really happens. <laughs> so That's, that's um, really yeah. interesting. Like, so... Um, do you uh, saying yeah? So I'm probably jumping ahead too far, but I th this is really interesting. So like the um, saying like the that companies want the most bang for their buck, so they're going to take somebody who can handle some of the back end logic, who can be a really strong maybe JavaScript developer in in today's age, um, and then they can do some CSS. But that if they're not proficient in the front of the front that might slow them down. I mean, what, do you feel like you've been able to make the argument that it's actually more, is it, uh, yeah, maybe I should ask this more generically. Is it more generally more productive for a team to have someone who's focused more on the logic and then someone who's focused more on the presentation of that logic or to have somebody who's two people who can do both of those things pretty well? Yeah. I mean, best case scenario is those folks are talking to each other. <laughs> I think there's definitely benefits in allowing for specialization. Um, like I said, if you're, for anybody, uh, even if you know a, a lot about all of these areas, it's still really hard in an enterprise environment to um, continuously keep on top of the quality of each of these areas as just a handful of full stack folks. Um, so definitely that collaboration would is my ideal world, right? <laughs> Again, I think it's unfortunately a little bit um, rare that that is, happens or maybe it's not always feasible. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely st speaking of an ideal world that I'd like to see us move towards. Um, but um, yeah, so they are, you know, talking to each other, but also, um, considering that wider ecosystem, like I mentioned, accessibility, performance, I think I, I'm hoping that that is the area where we're kind of realizing that those need to be larger focus areas, regardless of what you're building. Um, so I'm hopeful that those areas are where we can start to see um, front of the front end folks a little more respected and you know, considered key members and paid appropriately on their teams. Absolutely. Absolutely. So um, coming back to uh, what you had said about, you talked about, well, it, it's easier for folks to learn once you start peeling back the layers. Like it, CSS can look scary from the outside, but if you give it a little bit of time and you learn the modern uh, patterns that you can, um, you can be pretty effective with it. Pretty, I mean, you know, with, with, um, 
timing being relative there. So can let, let's just start with, uh, can you tell us a little bit about your the side projects or, or the work you're doing in the community to make that transition easier for developers? Yeah, so um, I started producing some educational materials, coincidentally, the fall right before uh, the pandemic. Um, so I was already starting to create something. And I started by creating a course for beginner developers, folks that have zero experience and trying to give them just this video slash written tutorial course um, completely free that they could take. And um, I've learned a lot since then. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of how to produce educational content. I do stand by the, the overall course materials. Um, but that kind of evolved into, I was at a particular point in my career, I was working in design systems, leading the development of a multi-platform design system. And through that work, um, realizing that CSS was had grown up a lot, but also um, was still yeah, kind of <laughs> something that frustrated a lot of developers. Um, and I had started kind of boosting my own, you know, kind of going back and reexamining some things I thought I knew about it as well in order to uh, make our design system the best it could be. So um, that was also about the time where some of these initiatives to um, focus on cross-browser compatibility, stability of existing features started taking off. So that was kind of just all good timing. Um, mm -hmm. But I shortly rolled out moderncss.dev. So that's uh, my tagline there is modern CSS solutions for old CSS problems. So pretty point blank addressing <laughs> that niche. Um, and again, I had some evolution of that project. The early ones were truly very literally uh, problems that I remember solving and now had a much more simplistic uh, native CSS way to solve mm, um, okay. things that I remember using jQuery as a polyfill <laughs> um, yes, that now yes. landed, for example. So, um, and then that kind of evolved to trying to not only tell folks how to solve a particular problem, but also just try to more holistically give them tools um, where even if they came to the site from whatever search term about a specific problem, that they're hopefully try to give them additional um, information about features, accessibility, um, also it being an emphasis for me to include throughout my uh, solutions um, and just kind of prompt them to look at the wider implications of the choices they're making, the solutions that they're developing, and kind of maybe stick some of those facts in their brain along the way. Um, and a companion project to that is smolcss.dev, S-M-O-L. And that addresses the crowd that is just trying to get in, get out with a solution, um, but give them just a shorter reason of why that solution might be um, what it's doing for you, and then again, any accessibility or other sorts of concerns you may still need to be aware of, but it shows a gallery of a lot of things that are stable today. So it's not just like this ideal thing. You also have to have a polyfill. You also need to do this or that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They are stable things, um, which is pretty exciting. And I think just a you know quick scroll through that shows you the breadth of what is now in the language and addresses um, some old hacks that we used to do. So what are some of your favorite, um, yeah, the, 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 the transformations that have, have, have happened and the, or yeah, like what's the, what's the most drastic example you can think of, of something that was so painful to do 10 years ago and now it's super easy with modern CSS. Yeah, so I have, I'll give you three really quick hitting examples. So the first one is, um, I also focus on really practical stuff, right? So I'm not going to really mm -hmm. talk about animations and whatnot, and even though there's been movement in those areas. Um, on a really practical level, um, aspect ratio has been just this wildly important <laughs> property to come to CSS. So if you think of, um, some folks might be familiar with what's called the padding hack, where you used um, a zero high element and padding bottom to 
of what was it? Fifty six point two five percent to that's, get that's the, it. Yeah, the nine nine ratio <laughs> yeah. of video um, to prop open that space for an iframe and keep your sixteen by nine ratio. Now we have aspect dash ratio. That's a property very well supported at this point in time. Um, and you just provide your ratio in there. So you do aspect dash ratio, 16 slash nine. There you go, or whatever other, or just put one, and then you have a perfect square. Um, pretty magical stuff from just that one property. Another one is um, the marker pseudo selector. So that's going to be um, the pseudo selector. So it's colon, colon marker. And that lets you style the bullet points or the numerics in lists. So um, okay. it has a limited set of properties, but who among us hasn't tried to change just the color of bullets in a list, right? Yeah. Yeah. Now you can do it with the marker property rather than trying to have uh, these extra wrapping elements, which you, uh, you know, some folks may be familiar with trying to do. Uh, what were we, what were we doing previously? Was it like hiding the bullet and then having like, um, a bef before element, something like that? You might do a before you might try to, uh, give the list one color and then wrap each element, each, uh, contents of the list in a span, uh, to, to give it the different color. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, those are two that I remember doing, uh, in different contexts. Um, but yeah, the last one that kind of has really been revolutionary is the, uh, math function clamp. So might ring a bell mm. a lot if you've heard of fluid typography, that's like the most popular <laughs> context that folks like to demonstrate the use of clamp. So in other words, instead of using media queries to say, here's my, um, you know, font size at a small size, and then at my next breakpoint, a little bit larger, my next breakpoint, maybe a little bit larger, you can assign that all within clamp, it accepts three values, a minimum, an ideal value and a maximum value. And so you can in that ideal space, it's sort of a dynamic unit, or if you use a dynamic unit, like view width, or now we have container query units, which is even more exciting. Um, you essentially are asking the browser to um, compute the value based on that dynamic width, if we say a view width unit. So if it's four view widths, now that's going to change as the viewport size changes. And so the clamp function basically will allow the browser to go as small as that first value or as large as the higher end of that range, mm -hmm. um, but not break out of that range. Um, and so that reduces all those media queries you may have had down to one property to define those values. That's amazing. I remember not even uh, using media queries, but also then writing these crazy complex JavaScript functions. Oh, yes. like, well, how <laughs> wide is the screen? How big should my font? How much text do I have? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. So those are my kind of quick hitting ones. I mean, there's there's been quite a few just this year that have made quite a pretty big splash and got folks excited for them to uh, begin to land in browsers as well. So um, those ones that I just mentioned have actually been around for a little bit longer, um, by which I mean one or two years. <laughs> yeah, but, so, but, but still, well, that was actually going to be my next question, which, which is like, what are the what are the hot proposals now, or what what is the next revolutionary thing or set of things that that is going to come to CSS? Yeah, so not just going to come, but in. Um, in evergreen, I'm double checking one to make sure I'm right that that's evergreen. Almost. Okay, so probably the most recent one to gets most <laughs> most of our evergreen browsers. Firefox is the holdout at the moment, but the has pseudo class. So that's the quote unquote parrot selector, but it's much more than that. Um, so using has, you can check if a parent element has a particular child. So if I want to check if a um, particular div has a image child. I would literally put the image inside of the has. <laughs> and I actually can use that to style the parent itself. Or I can expand off of that. So I can say a div that has an image, you know, a space, um, okay. then style the image itself in a particular way. Um, and it's just, I'm super excited for it, increasing 
our ability to pre-plan these scenarios. Um, again, a design system context, it makes me really excited to have has <laughs> um, and it kind of ship these pre-planned features rather than having to override or, you know, just different frustrations yeah. down the road or give extra implementation details. Like instead of saying, if you have an image at the top, add this class. If it's at the bottom, add this class. Now we can say if it has an image as the first child or, or you know, different arrangements, then I can affect not just the image, but anything after it, just the whole, the whole entire component using has. Well, it's super interesting. And it, it makes me um, think that, okay, so all of these advancements in CSS are, they're actually, one maybe maybe another argument for why you should love CSS is that the more that we work into CSS's capabilities, the easier the the JavaScript and the markup becomes. You don't need as much uh, logic. Is, is, do you yeah. feel like that's true? Yes. It. Um, I think I had a tweet a few months ago that when has and container query lands, I will be removing it. Everyone will theoretically be able to remove probably a significant amount of JavaScript that you have. Not only that, you bring up just a kind of related note to that, the better that you understand CSS selectors, the more efficient you can select things in JavaScript, right? That's a very direct correlation. Yeah, true, yes. Um, yeah. And so has, you know, it just, just like any other CSS feature, it's available to you to use in a selector mm -hmm. in JavaScript. So, okay. yeah, uh, definitely, definitely a strong reason to <laughs> brush up on selectors in particular in CSS. Super interesting. Okay, yeah, this is um, I, I love this, and I w want to transition to um, the last segment of the show in a minute or two. But before we did that, I thought it would be interesting right before we transition to um, talk about a few just specific pieces of technology and to kind of get your take on relevancy and usefulness in in the broad context of um, CSS. And so the first one is SAS. So as CSS has evolves and continues to evolve. Um, what's your take on the the relevancy or role that SAS plays today and or will play in the future? Yeah, so this is something I'm particularly <laughs> still using. Um, I actually wrote a post in defense of SAS a few months ago, um, but yeah, it's it's. It depends on your context, right? Um, you might feel that it's a little heavy handed if you're doing a single use small project. Um, in my context that I work in of an enterprise design systems um, or you know any other context where you're maybe sharing styles among the, a team, you, and not only sharing them, but have a need to maybe rebrand or retheme, reskin, whatever term you wanna use, um, we can, get a long way today with custom properties having full um, support. Again, IE 11 was the <laughs> sticking point previously for that, but otherwise they're extremely well supported. Um, you know, and, and those are great for in-browser dynamic properties. Um, so the difference, just real quick, between a custom property and maybe using SAS or less or other preprocessors with variables mm -hmm is that SAS is going to compute that. It's going to be static in your style sheet. Um, and custom properties, you're going to be able to change client side, if you will, if you have a need to, which is great if you're switching between like a light theme and dark theme, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But they can work together. And that's why I still am a proponent of using SAS if your only uh, thought there is we have variables in CSS. Um, I still use SAS for the functions. So each function to loop over maybe my color tokens and spit out different versions of my buttons. I still find a lot of value in that because it means I can share styles across even just my personal projects uh, in addition to the context I mentioned before. Um, and I'm just supplying a new list of colors, right? Um, and then, I also find value still in some of the features that aren't quite in CSS, even though they're coming. Uh, nesting is coming to CSS, um, but that's still gonna be a ways down the road. Um, and some folks you know, throw back at me, well, why not use post CSS? And that is definitely another option. It really depends which features you find useful for 
either your personal projects or in a team context. And I definitely encourage actually having the discussion with your team on how you feel you want to best maintain your styles and, and um, design your style sheets. Uh, I also appreciate for SAS putting my, you know, breaking up my styles into different style sheets. I that's probably mm -hmm. my very top feature that I will continue to use SAS for is that organization. Uh, that's great. Yeah, that makes that it makes a lot of sense. Okay, last one then is um, Tailwind has been making a ton of noise recently and and gained a lot of popularity. And I know this idea of um, a, like a utility driven CSS library is not a new concept, but um, Tailwind has done some things really well and, and caught a lot of folks' attention. So, uh, yeah, how do you how do you feel about Tailwind, and, and do you feel like uh, how does it help or hurt the perception of CSS or what role does it play in your um, view of CSS? Yeah, I definitely always get asked this question. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, I figured. <laughs> um, I don't feel it's the right tool for me. Um, I don't necessarily advocate or propose it in team situations that I'm a part of. Um, <clears throat> I'm probably a little bit biased because I do feel the design system context meshes more. And I know some folks still use it for the design system context. Um, and I know that it can also be broken up. Maybe you're just using it to help process and generate tokens. I know uh, Andy Bell actually uses that <laughs> despite not using other features. Um, I think that it all comes down to, I keep saying this, but it's because it's what's really most important is, you know, what it what makes sense to your team. I know it's attractive as different frameworks are as well in the sense of it already has documentation created. And that alone can be huge for teams to not have to manage and maintain their own documentation. Um, but that said, not every team is using the React or other such framework where you're sort of creating a component and you're setting it and forget it. Right. In that context, the list of classes probably isn't as impactful as folks who are developing WordPress themes or, you know, there's so many different contexts. And I think that the bubble around Tailwind is is assuming that you sort of do it and you don't really have to think about it. Or maybe you have other tooling supporting the tokens. Um, but but that's just not every project. And it's definitely not. Um, it's also probably easier to implement on something Greenfield than to go back into a legacy project and implement, whereas you can still get some gains in maybe moving your styles to SAS and sort of slowly migrating over and, and you know, working through things that way. Um, but maintainability, uh, documentation, and um, I, I another caution I have just really quick is you know, being aware that you may not be getting the new features. Um, a few that we didn't get to talk about today are container queries. I think I saw that they're trying to add that in. I, I don't know how that is. Maybe you enjoy that authoring experience. That's another consideration too. Um, I think a lot about accessibility features. I think about um, preference media queries. Um, these other things that it's not just about the style that you present in the moment, but it's also how is this style, how is this element adapting across viewports, across zoom sizes, um, in different color modes. And if all those are new terms to you, definitely look that up. I'm not <laughs> end of Tailwind addresses it or whatever framework you're choosing, but there's just a lot more to consider and... I would encourage you to not just assume it's available in the framework and to look a little beyond. It's a great point. And I, I think that you really touched on something that I I, I say a lot, which is that um, it's really great to keep a pulse on what's happening in the industry. And it's really fun to tinker with new things, but choosing the thing that's been around isn't necessarily bad. And that the, the most important thing is that you I like to say you you pick the right tool for the job. And yes. yeah, I think you said, yeah, do what suits your team the best. I I, I like that for sure. Um, okay, so with that, let's uh, let's transition into this final round of nine questions, this this new tradition with this newly designed show. Uh, these questions will be will be part tech and part uh, not tech, I, I suppose. Um, okay, you ready? 
Yes. Okay, here we go. Question number one. Uh, when a, we'll start, we'll start like with a formatting question. When a CSS rule has multiple selectors um, or, or set of rules, um, do they go on the same line or do they go on separate lines? This is a little muddied, um, separate, um, but <laughs> I'll just give you two, two things to go look up if you haven't heard of them yet. The is and where selectors, which kind of muddies it mm -hmm. a little bit. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll leave it at that for some research. <laughs> I like that. Okay. Uh, number two, where's the most interesting location where you, in which you've, you've written a line of code? Ooh, like environment or a project or either or? <laughs> uh, I would say like a uh, physical location. Where have you been? Oh, that, that, is, okay. that is most interesting. Yeah. While, while writing code. Yes. Um, I do do a fairly good job of leaving my laptop behind when I do vacations and things. <laughs> um, but... Yeah, so I don't know if I have anything super interesting. I, uh, I I feel like I did take it on one Florida vacation, but that was a long time ago. And I don't even think it was like fun by the beach or anything. <laughs> okay. Well, how, how would you answer it if um, the, the way you interpreted the question originally, like inside of, uh, I think you said in a, in a project or, or yeah. Um, yeah, I would say that makes, if I take that angle, it makes me think of maybe the most frustrating place, which would be inside of, a SharePoint site like a decade ago. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. You know, okay. Funny, funny, quick sidebar is that I, I've been blogging on and off for the last decade or so. And I think one of, one of the things that pushed me to um, continue to blog and, and to like really focus the, um, the goal of the site was that by far the most popular post I had for, from like, 2011 to 2016 was how to add JavaScript to a SharePoint page because you know, I had, had figured it, but it took me a long time to figure it out. And there's just no information. It's a good about chance it. I mean, I it's a that. Over. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I like that. I like that. Okay, number three. What's your favorite open source project that um, that you didn't personally create? Yeah, great question. Um. I think that I don't tend to use very many, like actually use very many. Um, I try to keep my build pretty slim. Um, I appreciate probably more resources than, you know, projects to bring in. Although I guess the one that's coming to mind right now is kind of newer um, is Lightning CSS, just because I have a lot of practical use for it in my projects. Mm, um, okay. The quick summary on that is it smashes together auto prefixer. It, it, they've created their own minifier, so it replaces like CSS Nano. It's a lot more efficient. Um, and so it took away, I eliminated, I think, four different packages to just slim down to that wow. one, which is really nice. So is that kind of a, is it a replacement for post CSS as well or, or something totally different? Um, for me, it was just because I only use post CSS for auto prefixer. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, but, and it does help transform some, a few other things. I think like range syntax, I can't remember right offhand. It's been a few weeks since I looked at it, but I think they are having a few different things that it will do. Interesting. I hadn't heard of that one. I'll have to look into that. Cool. Okay. Number four, what is a, uh, a movie that you could watch every day for the rest of your life? <laughs> oh goodness. That is an excellent question. I'm sure most people have an answer right ready to go. Um, all that's coming up for me is mostly childhood ones. Oh, you know what? Actually, probably A Knight's Tale. <laughs> I recently Amazing. remembered that was a, a thing. <laughs> that, yeah, that's, that's one. Of, I feel like there's, it has to be a certain type of movie, right? Like it can't be, it can't be super dramatic. Otherwise you just like, it's, it's going to get tiring. It's yes. going to get tiring. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, that's a nice, you got a nice balance there. <laughs> okay. Number five might be, uh, the answer might be, it depends and that's fine. But I was curious, what's your, your favorite CSS class naming convention? 
Yeah. So I usually end up with uh, BIM styled classes when I am developing utility classes um, or component classes. Um, but I'm also, um, I don't prescribe exactly to Andy Bell's Cube CSS, but when I read it, I was like, oh yeah, this pretty much meshes with how I'm writing stuff too, where you focus on kind of global styles. Um, you allow yourself to use element styles when it makes sense, um, possibly use data attributes. Um, so again, looking more holistically, looking beyond a certain methodology and what makes sense for the project and is going to help scale it um, to the future too. Okay. Okay. Is Cube like a, an evolution of BEM or is it just kind of similar? Um, it's a quote unquote methodology. Um, you, I would just encourage folks to look that up. It might mesh with how you like to think about or structure styles as well, or at least spark some new ideas on how that can be done. Um, but yeah, I think if I'm naming classes, BEM seems to suit my projects best, not just personally, but in a team environment. Okay. Uh, number, where are we? Number uh, six, what is your most enjoyable non-tech activity? <laughs> um, I watch probably every baking show that has to do <laughs> with friendly British people, um, <laughs> specifically. <laughs> <laughs> um, or the uh, here in the States Food Network um, holiday baking shows. Um, but also I am a mom. I have two little girls. So a lot of my time goes to them as well, <laughs> which yes, is usually <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> and, and definitely not tech related because it's just tech -related. probably um, chaos all the time. Yeah, right? my uh, five-year-old delivered a pretty sick bird on accident the other day. I ended up tweeting <laughs> about it. She, came, she happened to be home from school and um, she came over, watched me for a little bit and was like, and she said, asked me to do something. I'm like, oh, not right now. I was like, in the middle of a train of thought. I'm like, not right now. I'm, I'm a little busy. I can do it when I'm done with this. You're not busy. You're just making letters. <laughs> like, ah. Uh... Okay. <laughs> yep. Maybe <Yep>. true. <laughs> oh, amazing. Amazing. Um, I feel like my, I have a, I have a four year old, and it's instead of instead of telling me that I'm not working like that, she uh, usually turn it around on me the other way where I'll say, uh, yeah, wait a few minutes. And then when I then address her, she's like, I'm busy. You need to wait a few minutes. Okay. okay. There <laughs> Fair. Fair. okay number seven, uh, our, our pop culture question for the day, uh, Taylor Swift. Yes, no, or it depends. It depends. <laughs> yeah, I'll, it depends is a good answer. Okay, great, Not a 50. Great. Definitely wasn't in line for tickets. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't spend six hours on the computer yeah. on, uh, I mean, intention in line on the computer. Right. On Tuesday. Okay, great. Number eight. What is the, the best or, or most useful career advice that you've received so far? Hmm. Great question. Um, <clears throat> oh gosh, probably is a sign that I need to find more mentors, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've gotten any super advice lately, but, um, I think that, uh, you know, I, I, th I will kind of flip that just a tiny bit and say that not necessarily advice that I've been given, but, um, what has helped my, in my career is landing in environments where you have the support that you need, whether that's space to have autonomy over your projects, space to learn, and of course, space to have a voice. So I think that's something that's a gift that I've been given in a lot of my per, um, a lot of my positions, which I know is a blessing. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, so I think instead of advice, I would say, seek that out for yourself. It does exist. <laughs> Okay. okay, I like that. All right, number nine, last one today. So the the scenario is that you can host a lunch with anyone, alive or not. Who would who would you who would it be? One person. Ooh, one person. Oof. 
alive or not? Um, I think I'd have to go back to like somebody like Alan Turing or, um, um, oh gosh, I feel bad. I'm blanking on, on her name, but the Anna Lovelace, Lovelace or somebody like that, just like get inside their mind of what they were thinking <laughs> about computing in the early days would be fascinating. That would be that would be super interesting. Yes, <laughs> and probably if we if we could say hypothetically that um, th that the the lunch would take place in current times, that you'd also then yeah. get to bring them up to speed and everything that's happened. <laughs> it like, totally blow their mind. Yes, that'd be pretty cool <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. This has been a ton of fun. Really enjoyed having you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. For sure. So before we go, uh, give you a second to um, tell listeners and, and viewers, one, how to get in touch with you, and then it feel free to plug anything else that you might be working on today. Yeah, well, I'm still on the sinking ship that is Twitter. Well, <laughs> you can find me there as well as a lot of other places as 5T3PH. Um, from there, you can get to my links page that has uh, my portfolio and links to pretty much all my resources. The one I'll plug that um, I am going to refocus my energy on in the new year is I'm building a companion to modern CSS, which will actually help guide you through building some projects and be more of a learning path um, that is video and gives you challenges to build out. And so you can find that on modernCSS.dev which is also where you can sign up for my newsletter, um, which has been on a hiatus, but I'll probably start publishing that a bit more um, and until I find a new home beyond Twitter <laughs> where you can find me. Great. Okay, and for all of those uh, who are watching and listening in, just a quick reminder that these shows are recorded live on the first and third Thursdays of each month at 1 p.m. Eastern time in the U.S., which is 5 p.m. GMT. The shows are then later syndicated on CFE.dev and YouTube in video form and also in audio format wherever you get your podcasts. Until then, from all of us at CFE.dev, thank you for joining us for this show, and I'll see you next time.